Welcome to ThreatWise TV, I'm Hazel Burton. Today we are delving deep into the topic of XDR, or to give it its Sunday name, Extended Detection and Response. We talk to the Head of Security Operations for a university that has one of the most fascinating and bizarre networks I've ever seen. Think robots swimming in the sea and space satellites. We discuss how they use XDR to protect their most critical assets. We'll also hear from Cisco Talos' Head of Outreach about some of the seismic shifts in the threat landscape. Plus, we'll talk about Cisco's XDR solution, because that's what we do, and how we help organizations make XDR work really effectively within their own existing security environments. So stay tuned. Now, I don't know about you, but the vast amounts of names, acronyms, and jargon contained within the security industry can often put me into a tailspin of confusion. So I spoke to AJ Shipley, Vice President for Product Management for Cisco's Threat Detection and Response Portfolio, to help me get to the bottom of XDR's true purpose. We came across a definition, and I can't take credit for it. Um, actually, uh, this was an IDC report, but uh, they, they defined XDR. And we really, really liked it because of how concise and how clear and how comprehensive it was. And so what IDC says is that in its most simplest form, XDR is three things. It's the collection of telemetry from multiple sources um, and multiple being the operative word there. It is then the application of analytics on that collected telemetry in order to detect something malicious in the environment and then the response and remediation of that maliciousness. Detection without remediation is insufficient. But remediation without detection is impossible. And the bridge between detection and remediation is investigation. And our goal is to try to shrink that investigation time as much as possible and provide those proactive recommendations informed by evidence so that those analysts can get to that remediation as quickly as possible and then get back up and running. As we know all too well, security isn't just about prevention. Investigating what happened as quickly as possible, as well as what could happen, has become a fundamental. And a lot of that is due to what's been happening in the threat landscape. To tell you more about that and where we see these trends going in the future, here is Cisco Talos' Head of Outreach, Nick Biasini. He talks about the activities of state-sponsored actors, as well as cyber criminals who might be motivated by financial gains. So if you go back, honestly, at this point, it's a couple of decades. The world has been marching towards this, this, this drum of globalization. The, the progress and the motion has been away from manufacturing locally and instead using global partners to manufacture goods and ship them to you just in the time that you need them. The whole concept around just-in-time shipping and manufacturing. There's a huge push over the last several decades to get to that. Then the pandemic happened and all of the supply chain issues associated with the pandemic began to rear their head. And we started seeing things like massive chip shortages, problems of people getting access to, to everyday goods like diapers and toilet paper and things like that. And what it really did is it spurred change at the national level. What we're seeing more and more of now is nations promoting manufacturing inside their own borders. This push is real and it is going to have an impact on the landscape. It is very hard to develop intellectual property. And as more and more countries start moving in this direction, they're going to look for shortcuts. I mean, it, money is expensive. You're going to be looking for ways to cut corners every way that you can. And stealing IP is a very, very effective way to really cut a lot of corners. It, the impact is probably a little bit more acute on the, the state, the nation state side of things, because the, their budgets are going to be a little bit more structured than the cyber criminals would. But it, it, regardless, because money is becoming increasingly expensive, it's all about showing value. And it's about doing things for as quickly or as easily as a mechanism as you can. From a nation state perspective, that would mean, you know, potentially using cyber activities as opposed to physical things, because you're not putting assets at risk and the cost is far, far lower. For cyber criminals though, it does create a potential hotbed of people who are willing to do things they wouldn't otherwise. The economy is slowing down. Lots of people have lost very large sums of money in cryptocurrencies over the last several years. 
And that really creates an environment of people who are acting more out of desperation. And let's be honest, most people don't want to commit crimes. The only time they're doing it is because they absolutely have no other choice. And that, unfortunately, is a scenario we're likely to face more of in the months and years ahead. It's certainly true that there is now a lower barrier for entry for attackers. They might not have the technical expertise to carry out an attack, but they certainly have the motive and the means can often be downloaded from the internet. And specifically, I don't know if the adversary is necessarily getting more sophisticated or that the sophisticated tactics and techniques that were once the domain of very sophisticated nation state actors are now starting to become more general and more available to um, other you know, threat actors, whether it's you know, kind of cybercrime gangs, organized crime, script kiddies, you know, whatever. Um, I think it's, it's just, it's getting harder and harder because of how the sophistication is evolving and the multiple tactics and techniques that they have at their disposal to be able to detect or rely on a single kind of point product or solution like an endpoint detection and response solution, for example, um, in order to try to detect or remediate. The collection of telemetry from multiple sources is critical because of the changing nature of the threat. And then we haven't even talked about like some of these new emerging you know, tech trends like generative AI. Right. And how can the use of generative AI create phishing emails where in the past we could rely on really bad grammar to detect those Nigerian print schemes? It's um, it's kind of a perfect storm that's all coming together that necessitates a fundamentally different approach to this problem. At Cisco Live Emir, I caught up with a customer of ours, Christopher, who is the head of security operations at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. The university has an international focus. So many of the students and employees are dispersed around the world. Now they are experimenting with all kinds of things from nanotechnology to building robots that I can only assume will appear in a future Rocky film. They have on average 110,000 clients connecting to their network every single day. So what is Christopher's view of XDR? Spoiler alert, he has a new name for it. I call it sense of fusion. Because, you know, you try to, to uh, collect uh, signals from different perspectives in the network or on the systems. So it can be on the system or on the network itself. And you try to correlate this to get a better situational awareness and view of what is actually happening. So I kind of compared a little bit uh, by, you know, throwing a stone in the water and you have the ripples, you know. So, um, so you try to catch all these ripples and the source and try to immerse it and see the whole picture of what is happening. Uh, so, so for me, that's kind of XDR. And then of course the response part is, um, is, um, kind of new, uh, before it was scripts. Now we have better tools that goes quite a lot faster. And from Christopher's perspective of running a SOC, how does XDR need to evolve in the future to help his organization be as protected as possible? That is a good question. I think, um, it need to, to kind of grow organically, you know, we need to see what the needs are because it's changing all the time, but you know, you, you need the detection part and you need to be able to correlate things and you need to do some kind of response or action because without the action detection is useless, you know, so it's no point of detecting things if you can't do anything about it. It's just noise. And that is where threat intelligence comes in. Christopher's approach is to incorporate threat intelligence from his vendors as well as conduct their own internal analysis within the SOC. And that is a key part of his XDR strategy. We use um, like Sabai, like Talos for like the global perspective. And then we put our own intelligence on top of that. So we kind of like, you know, 80% is coming from vendors because, you know, globally we don't have the manpower or, or an insight to, to, to do, do this. But, you know, when it comes to threats that are actually going towards us as a university, and uh, then we're doing that part ourselves and put everything into a database and merge it with the global intelligence. So, so that we got that little extra context on top. So back to AJ, what are the key use cases for XDR and where can it help from both a prevention and a post compromise scenario? So in the same way that an email system, for example, can um, attempt to keep phishing emails out of your environment, we can also detect candidly, when it got through for whatever reason or what attachment might have been on that email as well, who opened it, who clicked it, where that initial entry point was, who else might have received that email, and then ultimately it is a remediation factor to go back in and delete those emails out 
hopefully before they ever got opened. But in the case that they got opened, also you can continue um, your investigation and your response actions there. Similarly on the endpoint, right? The endpoint is going to try to keep that malware from running. But at the end of the day, sometimes that malware runs for whatever reason. It's a new variant, new strain. And you still want to use that endpoint in order to isolate or quarantine that host while you can remediate. So the where XDR fits in really is to be thought of as kind of like that left of something bad happening from a time scale perspective or that right of something bad happening. And everything that is on the right, you know, right of boom, as we say, is where your extended detection and response solution comes in to be able to detect when an adversary was able to exploit something, either a you know a person or an application vulnerability or or, or a um, or a device, and then to be able to respond as quickly as possible and get back up and running. Now, in case you're wondering, what is Cisco's XDR solution and how would it help me? Well, I pose that same question to AJ. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give you kind of two reasons. The first one is just recognizing that uh, Cisco is you know, in 100% of the Fortune 100 companies, right? Like everybody knows Cisco is the networking company, but if you know, talk to any CISO in an, in an organization, a, a chief information security officer or any SOC analyst, and they will tell you that, um, that, the, that the network is the only system of record that they have post a breach to really understand the significance or really kind of the, how widespread that breach was. And then, you know, potentially what was accessed and then how to go back and, um, you know, remediate that. I think SolarWinds is a perfect example. Um, you know, even within Cisco's environment, um, our ability to correlate network telemetry all the way back down to the endpoint and the specific process that was running and the command line arguments that were passed to that process to know whether or not that endpoint close should have been connecting with one of those servers out on the internet, one of those SolarWinds servers out on the internet. Because again, not all connections to SolarWinds was malicious. But only by being able to correlate that network telemetry all the way back down to the process, could we make a determination that that host actually should or should not have been, you know, communicating to that server out on the internet and then use that as part of our response and remediation. Because to be clear, adversaries don't land on your high value assets. They don't land in your data center on the servers where all of the data is at. They, they land on a laptop and then they move or they traverse laterally through the network to get to your domain controller or to get to those high value assets. Only by being able to correlate the network telemetry all the way back to the endpoint or the email or the initial vector is how you're going to be able to do this. And I think Cisco Cisco brings a, a visibility and a footprint um, that is, you know, candidly unmatched by anybody else in the industry. And we are leveraging that. The second thing that I'll say is um, everybody at Cisco within security and specifically within threat detection and response takes this very, very personal. And here's why I say that. Um, all of us are customers of our customers. My mortgage is held by a very, very large regional bank out here in California. Um, myself and my entire family goes to a very, very large health maintenance organization out here in California. Both that bank and that health maintenance organization or hospital are large customers of Cisco. But I am a customer of theirs. Meaning if they get compromised, then potentially my mortgage or my family's medical records gets stolen, and somebody does something malicious with it. It potentially compromises our way of life. And every single one of the folks who work within security at, at, at Cisco are customers of our customers. Because again, we're in 100% of the Fortune 100. And they all recognize the responsibility and the obligation that they have, not just to keep our customers safe, but really to keep our friends and our family and our loved ones safe as well. Because we're all in this together, right? I mean, this is, you know, how a society operates. And, and I think that approach, that, that, that esprit de corps that we have, but also like that very, very deep sense of mission that we take or that we have and, and that we apply to this problem is why I think our customers should have a lot of confidence in us to go solve this problem for them. To find out more about Cisco's XDR solution and how it can help your organization, head to cisco.com slash go slash XDR. That is all for this episode of ThreatWise TV. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back with another episode very soon. Take care.